it's all a little bit of, you know, and I like that so much because what I wanted to, to start with, I, I was with, with IBDET in the very beginning uh, from 2000 or it was 2001 till 2012. And I saw it, you know, grow and I saw a lot of other things. And now I'm back since a couple of years. Uh, uh, and I must say, I very much enjoy it. I've been talking to uh, Steffi, who's the, the great master of, of knowledge, of ceremony, and of management, and on a, of a number of other things. A big hand for her. <laughs> so I've been talking to her about the program, the substance, and all that kind of things. And at a sudden moment, I thought, it is important to share with you tonight something which will be on the agenda for the next years, and that has to do with social neurosciences. Now, um, uh, social neurosciences combines the breadth of social sciences, including economics and psychology, with the depth of neuro and biology sciences, uh, in including research on, please don't be upset, on hormones and on heart rhythms and on electrodermal activities. I'll come to that in a second. The concept itself was coined in 1993 by a couple of Americans together with somebody from another part of the world. Personally, my interest in this field started now about 10 years ago when I was invited to be one of the three directors of a national program in the Netherlands on what the role is of brain, cognition, behavior, biology for three social fields. One was education, the other was um, uh, uh, health, and the third was crime, justice, insecurity, corruption, etc. And I was, became responsible for that particular field. The Dutch government gave 21 million euro over a runtime of six years to develop the knowledge base on social neurosciences and what can we learn from it? How can we, how can we use that kind of knowledge for developing interventions? I will share with you a couple of examples. How can we, how can we train students in that field? How important is it? How dangerous is it? There are a lot of ethical issues when you deal with research into hormones and research dealing with um, brain and cognition. So that was the reason why I, um, why I participated in this. Well, this is in Dutch, but the only interesting word is NeuroLab. NeuroLab is the follow-up of the program that I had the pleasure to uh, co-direct, which was evaluated, of course, dear friends, Everything is evaluated in the world. Also, a national science program on brain and cognition, I think rightly so. So it was evaluated, and that led to a follow-up, which was the uh, NeuroLab, NL. NL stands for the Netherlands. Okay, now, um, what, what is the relationship with uh, this field of study and uh, development? Well, there's a lot to say about that, but let me start with this absolutely monumental World Bank development report from 2015. The World Bank then absolutely discovered the importance of relationship between mind, society, and behavior. And the World Bank said, we know enough, well, not enough, but we know a lot about classic variables, you know, like uh, a person's socioeconomic status, uh, certain attitudes, family situation, political preferences, etc. Uh, we need to go further, this report said. And the report digged into different types of thinking in line with the Nobel Prize winner um, uh, Kahneman, fast and slow thinking. It looked into experience and duration of stress in relation to your position in the world. It looked into a person's executive functions. For the psychologists, are there psychologists in the room? Okay. The abbreviation well known is EF, executive functions. Executive functions, dear friends, uh, regard a person's capability to direct attention, to shift perspectives, to retain information in your working memory, and to control your impulses. Dr. Vasen. Uh, welcome to see you in particular because you go a long way back uh, together with me. And you know Jos Vasen from the World Bank. He's a senior advisor in evaluation now. It's a great man. Uh, as are you all because you are here with IBDET. IBDET 
not the new thing, but a continuous thing in development evaluation. And that's why I think it's important to go back to my slide. So the World Bank in 2015 was of the opinion that the development policies and, uh, should use more that kind of knowledge uh, and that they were not adequately, uh, let's say, addressed and discussed. The World Bank in that report difference was also very critical about the way in which what it called standard economics addresses and again, a quote, the messy and mysterious internal workings of actors. And internal workings of actors with that is meant what people think, what people do, what their motivations are, what their stress levels are, how dangerous, how happy they are, uh, biopsychological aspects. So the bank said, we, we are talking a lot of, about a lot of things, but we don't talk enough about these inner workings of, of, of actors, of people. Uh, at the same time, a colleague of mine, um, Brad Asbury and I, we published a paper in the uh, American Journal of Evaluation where we looked into what standard evaluations were doing with mechanisms. This is a paper which is called Opening Up the Black Box, and it's still often relatively often cited. We too held a plea for focusing more on, on mechanisms and biopsychological and other types of mechanisms. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, as the World Bank was showing and as a lot of other organizations have been showing and a lot of other you know, academics have been showing, usually, well not usually, often these mechanisms are not articulated by policymakers. So we still often have the following situation and I apologize for the gender mistakes that are made in this cartoon bank. So you see two old guys, I may say that because I'm old myself, who, who are not in, uh, let's say, in policy making, but they, they, they are talking to each other and they say, one said to the other, I, there's, there's a miracle occurring. And the other is saying, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Now take that, that cartoon to the world of evaluation and to the world of development policies. How many times do we implicitly not think there is a, a miracle happening? Well, the idea of opening up the black box and searching for also social neurosciences mechanism is to prevent that we think in terms of, uh, of, 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 of miracles and mysteries. And of course, that is central in evaluation, but in particular in evaluation it is relevant that we not only you know, pay attention, let's say, to the research design or to, to the utilization or to the interaction with stakeholders and others, all very important, but also it is important to think about the knowledge basis, the, the foundations, the social and behavioral and social neurosciences fields that are, are happening and where things are happening that are rather important uh, for evaluators. You all know this kind of, of, of pictures. This is a theory of change. It's, it's a kind of artwork, you know, with bullets and lines and arrows and boxes and boxes saying these are the mechanism the sun is shining which is true for today and for the last days but the sun is not always shining and according to some the sun is shining too much said this is not what I will be talking about a little later in the restraining 10 to 15 minutes max uh, Steffi you're, you're killing me if I talk too long okay well intellectually not physically um, Okay, so this is not what I'm talking about. This is exact, exactly what is not uh, focusing on real substantive underlying mechanisms. So I think I, I, I have said enough before going into six examples of what social neurosciences have to share, have to, what, we, what we can learn from that. But before I'm there, I first want to make a critical point. The point is the following. The number of books, papers, reports, studies, websites on complexity and development evaluation and complexity and development, they are numerous. Just a couple of titles, embracing complexity, harnessing complexity, complexity and complicatedness, the handbook on complexity and evaluation. I can go on for at least a couple of minutes. The interesting thing is that this phenomenal a magnitude of, of attention paid to institutional complexity, to macro social complexity, is completely not the case when you talk about 
complexity within the actors, within the persons, within you know, the behavior, the cognitions, the, 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 the nervous system, the endocrinological system. And we are all people with hormones and you know, nerves and we have a number of other things. Then we are in the end part of that large and complex institutional system. So what social neurosciences is doing is opening up the black box to find out what kind of mechanism, what kind of processes are taking place there. So we're not talking about macro institutional complexity, we're talking about the complexity inside and between humans. So here we go. This is where I want to be, but a little bit of an introduction is not too bad. Although I must say when I see all of you, you know, with the so-called wavering machines, or how do you call it, I, I think I am allowed to undress. I start with my jacket. Yeah, it will last till about two, two o'clock tonight. So there's no train back. Okay, so what is social neurosciences? Social neurosciences brings together a variety of scientists, disciplines, methodologies dedicated to investigating the biological mechanism of social interaction and vice versa. How social circumstances, contacts, um, situations, developments, policies, influence neuro and bio mechanisms. And this field dives into the problem of the mutual influence of biology and social mechanisms. Just as one example, there are many examples since the field started in 1993. This is by Cacioppi and some other people, including his wife, Neuroendocrinology of Social Isolation. When I read this some seven years, or some five years ago in a pre-publication version, I was shocked how much social isolation is doing to a person's body, is doing to his heart, to her heart, is doing to brains, etc. This is fascinating. The World Bank also paid attention to it when it talked about stress and, 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 and children. I'll come back to that in a second. But really, this is some of the fields where these things are happening. A couple of other recent things, new frontiers in social neuroscience. Some 18 chapters, by the way, you can get this all free. I mean, not that they are not, you know, trying to sell their stuff, but the number of their reports and publishers and even books are free. So new frontiers in social neurosciences. What's so social about the social brain? Another paper is on the neuroevolution of empathy and caring for others. Why it matters for morality. Morality, dear friends, is part of our business in the world of development evaluations. And here, finally, this is as an example by my good friend Jack Van Honk, who is professor at Utrecht and in Cape Town University, uh, South Africa. Testosterone and dominance in humans, behavioral and brain mechanism. Okay, so you're with me. You're with me, I hope. Maybe you're not with me, that's too bad for me. Maybe also a little bit for you. But we go now into relevance of SNS for development, society, including evaluation. I have six issues to share with you. Okay, here we go. Are you still with me, by the way? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, is this social desirable behavior? That's an artifact of question, of questionnaires. Be careful. If you use questionnaires, it's full of artifacts, including social desirability. If you do measurements on the body, there is no social desirability. It's the body. Okay, so first, social neuroscience and child development. Uh, studies are there now, uh, and not only a few, showing that killed children in poor families differ dramatically from children in richer families with regard to their cognitive and, and, and non-cognitive abilities resulting in a loss of human potential for themselves and society. Children frequently exposed to stressful events show a persistent activation of a major part of the neuroendocrine system that is related to, to stress and memories. So that's one. It's, this, is, this is the most simple one because all of you know that. Attachment problems. Attachment. You know, the famous Bowlby research on attachment between father and mother and mother and child and father and child, etc., etc. Research now is done longitudinally how to stimulate parents or caretakers to learn to attach to their babies. Maybe in the not too distant future to their grandparents, who knows. This, this learning how to attach 
and measuring you know, bi biological responses may sound strange because maybe some of you and maybe all of us assume that every father and mother has the inborn desire to realize attachment. Unfortunately, the world is different. Uh, but luckily, social neuroscientists now are looking into that. They are looking into the impact of programs like the Oregon Parenthood Management Training, where, where fathers and mothers and other caretakers are trained how to, how to attach. And there is neuro and biofeedback given to these parents during the experiment, during the evaluation, to find out what they think about it. Because it's not only that you know these things, but you also have to have, a, let's say, an experience with it. Other so-called supportive parenting activities and programs in early childhood, they are also developed and evaluated, and results show that these programs are important for the development of brain structures, including the area critical to the development of memory, the hippocampus. And without memory, dear friends, even now Google is everywhere, we are nowhere. Memory is important. Number three, emotion detection and regulation. Now, regulation, I have to, to be careful, this is not governmental regulation. This is not legislation and regulation, no, no. This is how to regulate emotions and how to regulate detection of emotions. Okay, it's a field of study that is of direct relevance when dealing with, for example, mediation, victim care, implementing recommendations from TRCs, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Committees, and we have quite a few of that kind of commissions. Often it is believed in those worlds, according to one of my better students who did a study on that, that if you organize a couple of meeting days where, you know, the chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, you know, gives a talk and people walk around and there is a little drink that, you know, afterwards, you know, it's all settled. And maybe you have to do that a couple of times. But research shows that in order to detect what emotions are, in order to, to yourself read the other person, to understand what neural mirrors, mirrors, uh, mirroring is doing, uh, what, is, what it is doing to your amygdala, never forget that word since, if, if, if you do not know it already, uh, that little thing which is crucial for, for emotion experience, emotion labeling, and next, uh, through your, your HPA axis to your behavior through stress and other hormones. That little thing that, that, that amygdala is, is almost taken care or unfortunately not in a number of situations, uh, how you detect and how you deal with your, with your emotions. So, you know, meetings only with truth and reconciliation committees, forget it, dear friends. Uh, the World Bank was already talking about it. The World Bank has recently also published and brought about papers talking about the relevance of, uh, of these executive functions um, in the current society where you need to have uh, soft skills, as the bank calls it. Uh, dysfunctions in, 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 in EF make life difficult, make life very difficult. Uh, well, luckily, we now have measurement techniques developed by uh, uh, social neurosciences people that help you to evaluate whether or not these interventions, and I have a number of them here for you, uh, for you printed, whether or not they are working, whether or not they have an impact. So you see neuropsychological training, you see mindfulness training, you see nutritional supplementation that is sometimes called the omega-3 factor psychophysiological feedback and also medication. So, you know, this whole thing dealing with, with emotion regulation is not, not only sociologically or criminologically or psychologically important, but also from this perspective. And let me hurry up with two final uh, topics. Number five is violent and antisocial behavior, including corruption and fraud which is not violent immediately at, at first sight, but can be very violent. There is a lot of research now going on dealing with this issue. Five minutes? No, no, okay. There's a lot of research going on in the field of violent and antisocial behavior, which is directly related to levels of arousal. So people have different levels of arousal. Some people, they need a lot of sensation seeking. 
in order to, to be, let's say, for themselves a happy person. And now there is a lot of also, you know, interventions being developed to try to remedy dysfunctions in, to some extent, the executive function, but also in what is called the low, uh, low versus high arousal uh, mechanisms. And to share with you, one of the indicators is low heart rate physiology. Now, don't be worried. If you have a low heart rate, it's not that you're going to be a criminal tomorrow. You can also become a fantastic player or a superb policy maker. But sometimes it works in the direction of, of antisocial behavior. I'll come to point six. Point six is of a completely different nature. It is how, in this case, UNDP, uh, by the person, uh, by the, the current head of this uh, organization, the evaluation department, Indra Nairo is using uh, knowledge funds and a professor from Harvard who also has an own company to train his staff, the evaluators, how to deal with their own emotions, how to deal with their own uncertainties, how to be capable to detect you know, emotion problems in others. And his idea is uh, to train his, his staff with these things and to do, you know, things together with the staff and, and reading a work that is being published by uh, the colleague from Harvard University with the own company. He's a rather well-known man. So there you see that brain and cognition, social neuroscience, is part of what you see right for you, right below. Neuro leadership. There is a special journal for that nowadays. The neuroscience of leading effective teams. And Indra Na Nairo is, is using that kind of knowledge in his work within UNDP. Okay, so time is almost up. I come to five conclusions. Conclusion one, for those of you that may think, I'm not sure that, I'm sure that nobody thinks it, but you never know, that you know, biological neuro, social neurosciences uh, knowledge is a kind of leading to deterministic fallacies. That is, you are born with a certain heart rate, you are born with a certain amygdala function or with your hippocampus or with your HPA axis. That is forever and forever. No way. That new bunch of research shows plasticity in the brains, plasticity in your genes, changeability. So the old-fashioned terrible idea that nature versus nurture is the thing there is. And in the 70s when I was studying behavioral and social sciences, nobody believed in biology. And, and maybe now some people believe a little bit too much. This is actually, it's a waste of time. These things go together. And that is one of the biggest things that social neurosciences have, the, have, have discovered. Second. Ethics, transparency, governance are crucial, dear colleagues. You never can do a study. I mean, we in general cannot do studies without paying attention to ethics. But as soon as you talk about you know, the biology of people, that's more in depth than the, let's say, a number of attitudinal surveys or talking about learning from evaluation. No, if you do this, you have to be very, very careful in ethics, transparency, and governance. But of course, we all are so. Number three and four and five. The idea, having this knowledge, is that you yourself, well, I mean, it's for, true for you, it's true for me, but it's true for all our you know, beneficiaries of, of programs, are in a better seat, in a better driving position of their own life. I mean, if you know that you have certain dangers, if you know that you, you have a short uh, you know, problem, you, 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 you want to move on, you cannot, you cannot completely address and, and, and guide your impulse control system. That is relevant for all of us. It's relevant for everybody. So when you know these things, you are in a better driving position. Number four, slowly but steadily, more empirically tested social, bio, and neuro interventions are becoming available. Let me, well, I'm not going into detail, but you saw a couple of them. There are also more trying to help people in their executive functioning, where you are learned, let's say, to, 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 to change your, 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 your decision making on the basis of these interventions. And it's, it's not Institutional, it's micro. It's within the working brains of people. Finally, applying social neurosciences in the developing world with all its institutional complexities, with all its unbelievably deep problems as poverty, but also terrorism, and evaluate the role that social neurosciences play 
is mucho importante compared to doing only some experiments with students at Leiden University or wherever it is. So actually, it's, it's a fascinating field, uh, the field you're in, to try to, to, to work together with, uh, with, with all these insights. My final words are, it is five years ago, dear friends, that the monumental World Bank report on mind, society, and behavior has been published. There is progress, and in my mind, uh, I think this, this type of knowledge is, is, is relevant for understanding the inner workings of actors, decision makers, civilians, victims, whatever you call it, that are part of what you are doing in your IPNET program. So I expect that in the next couple of years, slowly but steadily, a little bit more social neurosciences will end up in your programs, in your evaluations, and in your personal life. And with that, I stop my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>